Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is awesome looking out at all of you here. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Patricia Howler. I'm a licensed Unity teacher here at Unity in the Gold Country. Reverend Jerry's off today, so it is my pleasure to be up here giving you our talk for today. And of course, this is week three of our nine-week program for the book, The Universal Christ. And for those of you who are in study groups, you know how powerful this book is. This is amazing. So this morning, my talk is on original goodness and love. Did you kind of get that theme of love this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So Richard Rohr begins this chapter on original goodness by discussing a massive 150-year-old Rio Grande cottonwood tree that's in the backyard at his center in New Mexico. He was once told by an arborist that all the gnarled limbs of the tree actually might be a mutation that causes the huge trunks to make all the twists and turns that you see in that. People wonder sometimes how it even stands just because of the gnarliness of it. And yet he says it's easily the finest work of art that they have at the center. And that it's a perfect example of their core message. Divine perfection is precisely the ability to include what seems like an imperfection. So this is what the God source does in our lives. We are accepted just as we are and included in that beautiful universal love with all of our seemingly perfections and seemingly imperfections. This gnarled old cottonwood tree that Roar talks about is admired by people. But it's all the imperfections that people come to admire. So do we admire our imperfections? Or do we just admire our seemingly perfections? They say a mirror reflects back to us what is really true about us. And of course, most of the time when we look in the mirror, all we're usually looking at is what we see as our imperfections. However, there is a divine mirror that can be called, as Rohr says, the very mind of Christ. The Christ mirror reflects back to us the real truth of our being, not just what we see in this physical form. It's the Christed perfection of who and what we really are. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 21, it reads, It is because you do not know the truth that I write to you, but because you do know it already. So what is this real truth that we know already? That we are whole, complete, and perfect just as we are even with all these seeming imperfections. That as the image of God on this earth, we have a pure and total gift of the perfection of this God source that is absolute and unchanging. That there's nothing that we can do to increase it or decrease it. This God source is always with us. It always has been and it always will be. You can turn your back on it, you can deny it, but it will always be with you. However, that's not what most of us were first taught as we came into this earth. Some of us were taught something called original sin. <laughs> that we came into this earth as sinners, and that there was nothing we could do about it until we became baptized and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Until then, we were sinners, no matter how good we were. Which, of course, created for a lot of people on this earth to not only have a dislike for themselves, but for some, 
even had a repulsion for their own being. So I don't know how many of you today were raised with that philosophy and still have that feeling about yourself. Hopefully by this time that you're here in unity, you have looked at that and said, <laughs> forget that idea. I had original divinity born within me. But yet, we may still know people that do have that feeling about themselves. Richard Rohr writes, to begin climbing out of the hole of original sin, we must start to have a positive and generous cosmic vision. Generosity tends to feed on itself. I have never met a truly compassionate or loving human being who did not have a foundational and even deep trust in the inherent nature of humankind. And of course, with that comes a deep, deep trust that we actually matter in this world. What we have to do is to learn to trust reality, to choose to trust it as we see it down here around us. And as Rohr says, even our physicality, even all the things that seem so imperfect in this world, which then Richard writes, which is to finally trust ourselves. He writes, in the practical order, we find our original goodness when we can discover and own three attitudes or virtues deeply planted within us. And the first one is faith. And he says it's a trust in outer coherence itself, that it all means something. And the second is hope, a trust that this coherence is positive and is going somewhere good. And finally, love, a trust that this coherence includes me and defines me. For Pierre de Cardin, who was a French Jesuit priest that lived from 1881 to 1955, love was the very physical structure of the universe. For de Cardin, gravity, atomic bonding, orbits, ecosystems, force field, animal instincts, evolution, and so much more, all revealed an energy that is attracting all things and brings one to another toward a unification at a deep, deep level. To him, it was love showing up in different forms. For Richard Rohr, love which he says might be called the attraction of all things toward all things, really is a universal language and is an underlying energy that just keeps showing up no matter what we do, how we are, who we be, it's always there. So I have a question for you. How many times in your life have you actually rejected love? or had somebody reject your love? For those of us who have been married before and divorced, we know what that feels like. How many of you have had teenagers? <laughs> <laughs> we know what it's like to be rejected <laughs> in that way. And for most of us, love is a paradox, as Rohr puts it. He writes that it often involves making a clear decision, but at its heart, it's really not a matter of mind or willpower. But he says, it's a flow of energy willingly allowed and exchanged without requiring payment in return. How many of you have given something and expected something in return? How many of you have had somebody in your life that did something nice to you, and then because you didn't do something nice right back, there was dissension? 
That's not the love he's talking about. When he says, willingly allowed and exchanged and requiring nothing in return, to me that's love with a capital L. Roar Archer also writes that if you have never let God love you in the deep and subtle way that God does, you will not really know how to love another human being in the deepest, deepest ways that you are capable of. He writes that love allows and accommodates everything in the human experience, both the good and the so-called bad, and nothing else but that capital love of God can actually do this. When each one of us has been included in this huge spaciousness of divine love, capital B, capital L, divine love, there's just no room for human punishment, vengeance, judgment, retribution. If God's love accommodates everything in human experience and there is no judgment from God for anything that is happening or has ever happened, then how can we, if we are going to step up to that type of loving, ever hold anything against another person? Rohr writes, the crucified and risen Christ uses the mistakes of the past to create a positive future, a future of redemption instead of retribution. He does not eliminate or punish the mistakes. He uses them for transformative purposes. So once again, I have another question for you. How many of us have ever done something wrong and really regretted it afterwards? I think every one of us has. I think each and every person has done something at some point that they really regretted. But the big <coughs> question is, did you learn from it? And I could say, looking at them, who I know here, I think every one of us sitting in this room has learned from past mistakes. And we didn't have to be punished or had retribution taken against us because we knew at the moment we did something that we would never do it again. So when Roar writes, he uses them for transformative purposes. Isn't that what we did for ourselves? When we said things we, or did things we ended up regretting? So with that statement, the crucified and risen Christ uses the mistakes of the past to create a positive future a future of redemption instead of re retribution. Haven't we done our best at some point in our lives to create a more positive future for ourselves, hoping for redemption from the people that we have harmed or hurt in some way? So if the risen Christ doesn't eliminate the mistakes, but he uses them for our good, we also can't go back and eliminate what we did, but we can do as the risen Christ did and use it to transform our lives and the world around us. Rohr goes on to write, people formed by such love are indestructible. Forgiveness might just be the very best description of what God's goodness engenders in humanity. You know, if we truly regret things that we've said and done and make a real true decision on our lives that we will not project any more of the language or behavior that we did ever again in our lives, that's the indestructibility of our own personal self. And when you make that kind of a decision and make it from the depths of your soul, you will not go back on it. 
And there is no one in the world that can destroy that new aspect of your being. That creates you to be indestructible. So this aspect that is within each and every one of us, to be able to forgive ourselves at that deep, deep level, comes from that beautiful God source that is inside each and every one of us. That God source walks inside of you, moves inside of you, talks inside of you. But how do we find this love? How do we connect with this love? The capital L love that God has for us and that we have the capacity to reach, God brought roar rights that it seems to him that most humans need a love object to keep themselves both sane and happy, as he writes. That that love object becomes what he calls our North Star, <coughs> serving as our reason to keep putting one foot in front of the other in a happy and hopeful way. All of us need someone or something to connect our hearts to. And with that, it connects our hearts with our heads. Love grounds us by creating focus, direction, motivation, and even joy. So the question is, what is your love object? Or what was your love object growing up? How did you learn how to love? For a lot of you, you could say that you loved your parents when you were young. But I would say, did you have a dog or a cat that was yours? I bet you loved that dog or cat more than you could say you loved your parents. <laughs> I know that we had a dog in our family. And my younger brother took him as his. And of course, he let him sleep on his bed that my mother was upset about. He would feed him food off the table that my mother kept saying no to. But he didn't care. That was his dog. And I will tell you, he loved it. How many of you can relate to that in growing up? Or maybe you just had a best friend that you couldn't wait to see and play with, and you could share all of your secrets with, and do all the things together that best friends do. That's a love. The type of love that you're projecting out to a pet or a friend, we could consider that to be a training ground for growing into the type of love that God has for us. Unconditional. Roar writes to him, that to him, young parents with their brand new child is the closest thing to this God love quality that we have on this earth. For these brand new parents who so love their new child, that child becomes their North Star. And even more so than just to be called a love object. That new child gives them a full reason for being a reason to keep going during the day, a reason to put that one foot in front of the other, and a real <coughs> purpose for living life. So Roar writes that these brand new parents are feeling what we could call, call a God instinct, and one that you might call the need to adore. How many of you, with your first child, or if you can remember this, just wanted to hold that child all the time. Having him or her close, didn't want to put him or her down. That's adoration. That's adoration for this child of yours. What we need to do is to turn that adoration into an adoration of the God source energy inside of ourselves. I read once that if we were to place our full attention on the God source energy inside of us, with our every thought, our every breath, and complete adoration for that source inside of us, 
our lives would drastically change for the better. Rohr writes, if we knew how to adore God, then nothing could truly disturb our peace. <clears throat> we would travel through the world with the tranquility of the great rivers, but only if you knew how to adore God's source. The genius of love is that it teaches us how to give ourselves to imperfect things as well as the perfect things that we wish to see around us. He goes on to write, Love, you might say, is the training ground for adoration. So if we think about what we love in our world today, what do you love? Do you love a clean house? Do you love a beautiful yard? Do you love walking in the woods? Do you love a special TV program that you absolutely have to hurry home to watch so you can keep, you know what's going to happen this week in the program? It doesn't matter what it is that you love because you can answer, ask yourself, well, what brings me joy? Because joy is a part of love. So if you get excited dri driving home knowing that your special TV program is going to come on tonight and you're excited about it, you have brought up the feeling of excitement. You've brought up the feeling of joy. You've brought up the feeling. That feeling is love. Joy is love. Forget what it's about. Hold on to the feeling for all of your life. He finishes his chapter with this. The receiving of love lets us know that there is indeed a giver. And freedom to even ask for love is the beginning of the receiving. Then Jesus can rightly say, if you ask, you will receive. To ask is to open the conduit from your side but your only asking is the seconding of the motion, for the first motion is always from God. So I'm going to invite us to take this into a short time of meditation. So if you'll just close your eyes, take a deep breath. Richard Rohr makes the statement, God loves you by becoming you. What might it feel like to feel the presence of God inside of you as you? What would it feel like to feel the light of God inside of you as you? So I invite you to take a beautiful deep breath in. And as you let it out, ask that God source energy of you the light of God, to make its presence known inside of you as you. Take another deep breath in, and as you let it out, allow yourself just to feel your body. Each time you breathe in, and each time you breathe out, just allow yourself to feel your body in a completely different way. Ask again that this beautiful God source, the light of God, make its presence known to you inside of you as you. And now for just a couple moments as you sit there softly breathing in and out, allow yourself to feel the energy of God inside of you as you just sit for a few moments.
And now take a beautiful deep breath in. And as you let it out, find yourself coming back to this time and place. This exercise is not something just to do once. This exercise is something to do for a few moments, many times a day. For some of you, it won't be long, and you'll begin to feel something inside of you that's very different. For others, it may take a while. But for everyone who chooses to do this on a regular basis, I guarantee you that you will feel a presence and a power inside of you that you have never felt before. So let's end our time this morning with our threefold practice. And you can just keep yourself silent and stay in this place. And you, as you raise your hands up, God beyond me, in whom I live, move, and have my being. Hands folded together in front of you. God beside me, you are always with me. And hands crossed over your heart. God being me, I am the light of the world. I leave you in peace. And so it is.